My name is Paul Sherwood. I work for Kirklink and I'm here today to talk about progress that we're making on our own journey uh, on the path towards safety certification of open source software. Um, this is quite a challenge as I, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, not least because the traditional approaches to safety um, engineering require uh, commitment to deterministic behavior in software, uh, which I think is achievable at certain scales, but not so achievable these days with the um, advent of multi-core microprocessors and Linux scale systems. So we started on this particular phase of our journey in 2016. Um, Cothing's pretty well established in the automotive industry. We tend to work primarily with OEMs directly and tier ones. And we have a well established capability in addressing software integration issues and improving performance and stability of, of today's complex in vehicle systems. Um, a lot of those systems are running um, Linux based operating systems anyway. And a lot of that work, to be fair, is not, is not safety critical. But as the years have gone by, we've seen an increasing number of organizations interested in the possibility of achieving safety goals and making safety promises on systems which are also um, occupied with the kind of workloads that Linux is well suited for. Um, I guess the first real trigger for that for us was when it became clear that everybody is extremely interested in the possibility of autonomous vehicles. And autonomy tends to lead people towards Linux based systems anyway, because that's where a lot of the tooling has originated. And a lot of the research is based on Linux based machines. So um, there's a strong pull from the AI community, the machine learning community, uh, for Linux based solutions. Um, as a result of that kind of pressure and um, various comments that customers were, were making, we started wondering whether uh, there was a possibility that our work in infotainment, for example, might ultimately be safety related. At one point, uh, people in the industry were suggesting that infotainment itself needed to be considered as safety critical. And I'm not sure whether that uh, was a, a genuine uh, concern or whether it was more s s kind of scaremongering by organizations that had a vested interest in selling a hypervisor or some other safety um, certified product. And maybe, maybe the idea of just creating that impression would, would lead to more work for them. Um, our first direct look at the safety question as CodeThink came when one of the top tier ones asked us for a research involvement really to look at whether there was anything in the open source world that could improve their ability to do safety related engineering of these complex systems. In effect, they were saying that their traditional methods for safety analysis and safety mitigations were not scaling very well to the modern complexity in automotive systems. And they were wondering whether there were any um, methods or tools or even existing solutions in, in the open source world that could help them. And unfortunately, when we did that research, we quickly arrived at the conclusion that there wasn't very much at that time. Um, there was no magic. And in fact, one of the key people in our client that, that engaged us on this, uh, one of their safety experts, went out of his way to point out that in his view, although open source was good and they used it in, in many environments. Um, the simple fact that open source does not generally have requirements defined or an architecture meant that in his view, it was not going to ever be possible to really use open source in safety critical environments simply because the, the process that leads to open source uh, was not going to be fit for uh, the kind of analysis that's required in safety. Um, and then our kind of thinking was compounded by one of our clients 
lit literally asking me, um, did I believe that Linux could be safety cert certified? And based on what I knew at the time in 2016, I said that I didn't believe so. And unfortunately, that uh, was the answer he was looking for because he promptly said, so, OK, um, we've decided that we need to be um, r running safety critical stuff on, on our infotainment and therefore we're going for QNX for the whole thing. And that struck me at the time and still strikes me as, as a bit of an odd decision um, to go for changing your whole software architecture um, on the basis of a claim about one specific small piece of software, which in that case would, would have been the QNX microkernel. The idea that a, a, a safety commitment around one tiny piece of software um, is somehow more important than the performance, reliability, integrity of, of the whole systems struck me then as odd. And as we've continued with our analysis, we, we've concluded that it really is just odd. So that's where we started. Um, now, initially, uh, trying to understand what the standards say and, and what the safety uh, approach in general has been, um, Bear in mind that from CodeThink's perspective, we're coming at this as software experts, not safety experts. As we tried to digest the standards, um, broadly, it seemed that it was going to be a very difficult job to um, somehow shoehorn Linux and, and open source into the kind of um, approaches that, that the standards were highlighting in ISO 2662 specifically. Um, broadly offers the possibility that if you can show you've run your software in situ for 10 years and with reliability, then, then maybe that's a, a way to get to a proven in use argument that it's safe. Or alternatively, you would need to follow this traditional approach of showing that you've got requirements defined and you have an architecture and you show how that maps the code and back and you demonstrate that your safety goals are satisfied by applying uh, a significant amount of work and analysis to that whole process and then the final idea which uh kind of s struck me then as odd and, and still does is this idea of safety element out of context which is the approach that um some of the microkernel vendors have taken to establish a safety certificate for their products they in effect say that um, their component is generically safe um, they make constraints on, on what can and can't be done. So they provide a safety manual saying, this is how you must use our microkernel. Um, but they get to a piece of paper um, on the basis that their component is known to behave in a certain set of ways. Um, unfortunately, that, that its um, approach doesn't itself seem to obviously get us very far when we think about the reality of the kind of systems we're talking about. So if you look at the middle block in this diagram, uh, what we're basically saying is that on an SOC, which we might get a safety certificate for, uh, for the hardware, we're going to have a certificate for this kernel, or microkernel. But all of the other stuff that's run, uh, the drivers, firmware, um, and all of the applications on top of it, they clearly aren't part of that certificate. So most of the software that's going to be in the system is, is not um, related to the safety claim that's, that's been made by the microkernel and this strikes me as as really a, a huge hole in the argument um, there's very little merit to me uh, in making a claim about the kernel when you can't make claims about the whole behavior of the system so um, a general principle that, I, that i've established over, over some decades now in, in software engineering is that it doesn't matter what claim someone makes about their software if I can access the source code, I can break that claim just by changing one line of code. I, I can change an if statement. I can put an exit statement in. So it's trivially easy to change the behavior of software. And for a microkernel, for example, it would be trivially easy to change the behavior just by um, making drivers that misbehave, uh, which frankly happens in quite a lot of production projects. The, the drivers are custom for, for the work and um, safety will not be the primary concern when trying to get them working. So against this backdrop of what seemed obviously um, impossible approaches, uh, I started a discussion in public 
in a group called Trustable Software. And I made this assertion in 20, uh, 2016. I, I basically said that if we're going to trust software at all, we need to be able to make certain promises about it. We need to know who provides it. And we need to know that we can build it and we need, we need to know that we can um, rebuild it and, and be sure that it is the same software that we started with. We need to know what it does uh, and we need to know that it, it does what it's supposed to do. And ultimately, in the kind of systems we care about, uh, we need to be able to update the software and still have all of those promises hold true. Um, there was quite a lot of great debate in public around this on, on the mailing list at, at the Trustable Group. And uh, I don't want to kind of dismiss the, the work because it, it was significant and challenging and we, and we did a lot of thinking. Uh, but broadly, the, the simple uh, output came down to we need to prove why we have any confidence in the software. We, we need evidence to show that we have some com uh, that some basis for our confidence. It's not just it's not good enough just to um, have a certificate. That that is one kind of evidence. But you would need evidence of tests, evidence of design, evidence um, that people had actually thought about the problem and had demonstrated how the problem was was being addressed and how mitigations were in place for for their solutions. So wind forward from the trustable work, CodeThink has um, undertaken a series of projects in, in this area now, uh, in effect, figuring out the method, figuring out how we can approach the problem of making promises around software. And in the early part of 2021, work, we, working with one of our OEM customers, we settled on a safety concept that, that broadly requires a system method systematic method to be applied and the systematic method broadly says that we need to do risk analysis to be sure that we know what the problems are that we're trying to address and we need to provide tests to show that we address those um, problems so uh, in, in the context of safety specifically this means that we need to establish our safety goals establish our safety constraints and provide tests to show that the constraints are satisfied but then because as I said, software is trivially breakable. Um, that's not enough. We won't be able to guarantee that just because our tests pass, the uh, target software is guaranteed to behave the way uh, we're expecting. So we go to the other side of the argument and say, well, what would happen if the constraints were not satisfied? So we can easily achieve that with software. We, we have the opportunity to do fault injection by changing the code. And what this gives us is the ability to explore what would go wrong if a constraint is defeated. And uh, this leads us to the ability to systematically for the enclosing design to say, yes, here we have some software which we're confident behaves in a certain way. Um, but here it also is evidence that we can break it. And that can be used to test that the mitigations around the safety design actually work when the software would misbehave. And then we take that approach ultimately and wrap it into a continuous integration framework. So we automate the collection of evidence for this the design process, which leads to uh, the risk analysis outputs and the fault ejection and all of the tests and all of the test results. And we in effect, end up with a framework which allows us to apply that method systematically on an ongoing basis as a project is, is developed. And we then applied that method to a real scenario. We, uh, we looked at the actual process of constructing this kind of software. So we imagined a, a payload of an autonomous vehicle uh, trajectory calculation program. And we uh, used our methods to verify that we uh, could achieve a deterministic construction approach that would give us uh, sufficient confidence in the, the way of working uh, to be sure that the construction process itself was not going to pollute our output. So um, in effect, decoupling the environment factors and, and the software construction from the target payload even in this case of, of, a, of a supercritical payload, such as a, 
uh, an autonomous trajectory. And we were delighted to uh, achieve us an ACL D tool certificate for this. And this, I think, is our first real proof point that both the method works and that the method applies for open source because in, in assessing um, our work, pretty much everything we were using was open source. Our, um, our reference implementation is based on GitLab. Um, the tools that we're using are open source compilers and so on. There's nothing um, kind of that's pre-certified in anything that we did and we were able to achieve this certificate without um, the, the fact that anything was open source ha um, having any reaction or, or impact on the result. Um, so if you were to go to exceda.com, you could uh, look through their certified products list and you can find the full report that explains how um, this reference um, deterministic construction surface implementation works and the, the kind of analysis that, that led to this HLD certification. So the key point uh, from Coating's perspective is that the this, this certificate is a, is a proof point on, on the journey now. It, it gives us a basis for constructing so the kind of software we care about, for constructing Linux scale software that could be used in a safety critical environment. And that's where we now step on to the current work, which in effect is uh, building on that basis, that, that, that framework and method to assess an actual system with actual software. So we've chosen um, a, a specific application now, uh, and this again is based on real feedback from customers. Um, the suggestion that we, we hear in general is that organizations are not considering um, the idea of particularly of putting Linux in the braking system. What they're considering is they're going to already have Linux in significant um, machines in the vehicle. And the question is, could they safely provide some safety functionality on those machines in a way which was not compromised by the rest of the workloads? So if, um, if the Linux system were doing infotainment or some other um, user-facing kind of functionality, would it be possible for the same system running Linux to also contribute to the safety architecture and, and safety protections of the vehicle? So for our analysis, we've settled on the architecture you can see here, which is basically um, a Linux based operating system acting as host directly on the hardware. We chose the uh, Raspberry Pi 4 for our demonstrations. Um, we are running AGL as a kind of example infotainment system in a container. So, so that is um, isolated from the host via Linux containers. We have a safety application, which is this rear facing camera application. So the idea being that when the vehicle is put into reverse, the camera needs to get its image onto the screen pretty much immediately so that the user is clear if there's anything behind the vehicle, the camera image should reflect that. So in our uh, demonstration architecture, we have an actual rear facing camera, we have an actual display, and then we have some warning lights, which would in reality become um, some kind of warning indicator on, on the uh, console of the, the vehicle itself. So, the way we apply our process, um, this is the Raffia method that, that I've mentioned. Uh, we begin by a, an STPA uh, procedure, um, systems theoretic process analysis. And this is a method established by MIT, uh, by Nancy Leveson at MIT um, some years ago. It's, it's now, I think, increasingly established and, and maybe the de facto for system level thinking around safety these days. Uh, it gives us a top-down approach to consider what could go wrong in these kinds of complex systems. And it's systematic, it can be applied by software engineers. And we increasingly are, are kind of finding ways to improve the method for 
for using this um, so that software engineers feel comfortable that, that they understand why they're doing it and, and it contributes to the software engineering result. So in STPA, everything is treated as a set of controllers in effect. And in these diagrams, the, the uh, control signal tends to go downwards. So in this case, the user, for example, sends a control signal to the reverse gear by in our demo pressing, pressing a button. Um, feedback about what's actually happening is sent upwards in these diagrams. And the diagrams form the basis for analysis of what could happen when the controls structures that we believe are in place break down when, when things go wrong. So again, systematically, um, we analyze for each controller what could happen or what could go wrong when the control signal is sent, what could happen to, to go wrong when the control system is not sent for some reason, and what could go wrong when the control system is sent too early or too late or for too long a duration. So um, applying the STPA and the, the method that we've evolved around this STPA, this leads us to um, a set of constraints for the system, which in effect are safety requirements. And then from the constraints, we're able to identify responsibilities for the controllers as to what they must do in order to satisfy the constraints. And we end up with scenarios and unsafe control actions that, that state um, what can go wrong in effect and we use those as the basis for our tests. So a more detailed um, breakdown, this, so this goes more into the understanding of what the software parts are doing and it's the same kind of topology, we, we uh, have control signals going down, we have feedback coming up um, and we have as part of this analysis we, we quickly conclude that a, a critical component that's going to make um, the most difference to, to whether um, the safety behaviors are followed or not uh, is how the compositing happens, how, how the um, interaction between AGL driving the screen and our safety application trying to drive the screen with, with the camera feed directly. Um, how is that process going to, to work? So uh, let me show you our actual demo of the system in place. So uh, we're, we're quite pleased with this. Now we've um, managed to get AGL containerized on top of a Linux based host um, with full hardware graphic support and uh, with demonstrable control um, over the screen so that we can overlay the, the uh, rear facing camera without um, affecting the AGL behavior. So let's see if I can get that going there. So we, here we have AGL and on the bottom right you can see the dev board. So AGL is running. Uh, the breadboard has a couple of warning lights on it and a button which we're now going to press. So the button simulates the gear stick and as you can see the, the camera feed immediately overlays and is live. Um, and now we simulate the camera going offline for some reason. You can see that the warning lights go on and once the camera is reconnected the warning lights go off and the camera feed returns and then we can switch back. So that's the basic proof of the architecture. Now interestingly as we did the design uh, using STPA um, it caused us to evolve to an improved solution. So this is the original design where um, we started assessing how the container is going to interact with the compositor. And one of the example hazards is this question of what could what could go wrong if some application that we are, we're not in control of on AGL attempts to work to, with the compositor directly, could that interfere with our safety application? Um, so what happens if in effect, something in the container just grabs focus uh, because conceivably in, in this architecture that would be feasible. Um, so following through our analysis, we, we identify this as a use case. Um, our way of tracking requirements is, is based on YAML. Uh, this, this gives us the ability to 
run scripts to check that um, everything ties up, that we have um, requirements mapped to, to tests and, and so on. Um, and it, it gives us the basis for the formal documentation, which ultimately is required for the standards to show that you, you understand your requirements, you understand how the requirements are satisfied, and you can provide evidence of, of that. Um, so in this case, we uh, we trace from the unsafe control action to the to loss scenarios, and then from the loss scenarios to actual constraints that need to be applied. And and the key constraint that arises out of the the use case I've just described is we really can't afford to get into a situation where a rogue application is is taking control of the compositor. And this leads to a better design where. Now what we have is a nested compositor. So AGL is talking to the nested compositor, this will and one proxy. Um, and then only from there does anything that, that is in that container get access to the real compositor and we control the priority of, of that access. So now the camera application clearly has a very different um, ability to influence the outcome versus AG, the AGL uh, container. And this is just a demonstrably better design and, and it results from, from the STP work that we did. So that's approximately where we got to in terms of our current ongoing work around certifying a Linux. I'll just uh, finish with a summary slide. So we've been working actively on this topic now for something like five years. I think we've shown that the idea of fault injection is critical and that it does give us an actual path to certification. We've, we've proven that. And uh, the kind of further discussions with Exeter and, and with, with other customers give us confidence that that, that is a, a widely applicable approach. You know, it, it gives us the extra rigor that's required to compensate for the uncertainties in, in this kind of complex software. Uh, we've established now that STPA does provide us with a good framework for reasoning about the safety concerns and uh, we've, we've been productive now in figuring out how we can make the, the general safety concepts as, as described in STPA relevant for software so that software engineers don't kind of drown in a sea of uncertainty because they're, they're able to think about the specifics of software behavior and software tests, uh, which, which is a major benefit um, to be able to get the safety reasoning done by people who are expert in software is, is where we need to be really. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. We, um, we are actively looking at integrating into a wider range of test um, environments because ultimately this still does come down to how confident are you that your tests are representative, that you've covered all of the corner cases. And um, that, that leads ultimately to a, a need for a significant amount of testing. Uh, we have a new initiative starting with ARM, which is quite interesting. They, they've been working towards using a software library approach um, to provide extra assurance on hardware where perhaps the, the traditional lockstep method is not achievable. And we're interested to see see what, what that brings into the kind of architecture we've described. <laughs> and over the coming year, we expect to make significant further progress now on this basis of con continuous compliance, which is to say that um, we do see that whatever promise we make for software, as the projects continue, um, the software keeps changing. So we need to revalidate our analysis and revalidate our evidence on an ongoing basis. And it's simply not cost effective to have that requiring a huge amount of manual effort each time. So um, we have a strong interest in ensuring that the, the process of gathering the evidence and verifying that the evidence um, supports the assumptions we're, we're making and the claims we're making, um, making sure that that whole process is as automatic as possible uh, is a clear win for 
uh, both time and money for customers. So, thank you very much. I hope um, the talk has made sense and I look forward to answering your questions.